going to give you a report card. You're going to come up to the front, and Brooke's got a couple things she's going to hand out to you. And when you get that stuff, have a seat, take a quick look at the report card, and then we're going to continue on. We're going to have a little classroom discussion before you leave, uh, involving some angles and some rebound control issues, and then you can get out of your way. Kyle Hemming, come on up. Mika Breyer. Dane Gubbles. Xavier Belvo. It's the first time in 25 years I've had two of Xavier's in one can. It's a very rare game. You ever heard somebody named Xavier Hollinger? <laughs> the person that chuckles in the back is the one that reveals they know who that is. John Crow. John. Giggy, can you close that door? Yeah. Tyler, come on. Come on. Nick Stafford. Chris Malner. Rhea Matson. Adam Craven, Spencer Curry, Adam Hemming, sorry about the showdown. You guys all had a shower, right? 25 years, 800 to 1,000 kids a summer. You can't even imagine the bacteria on this one. Sammy Halfling, Drew Mackle, and Drew, I just have to chat with your dad before you go, okay? And Donovan Clark, world famous race car driver. Noah Lasky, Jack Adams, Hayden Richardson. Gabe, Gabe Robinson, sorry, Gabe Robinson. It's the best hat of the week right here. <laughs> Griffin, Burkhardt. And the second Xavier of the week, Xavier Hopkins. Kyle Lerz Williams. Lucas Williams. Taylor Hansberg, Hansiger. That's close. That's close. Chris Worrell. Choppers. Glenn Crandall. Okay. Isabel Spencer. Springer. Huh? Springer. Springer. Oh, you can blame him. <laughs> Who filled up hers? I know which employee to load her in as she regular. Be Danny Black. Oh, Danny Black. Where are you, Danny Black? <laughs> be expensive. Emma James. So, you see who made that mistake? Stand up, Danny. <laughs> you got a 4.0 in school. Goes to math camp. Supremely intelligent. You know what they say, smart in school. <laughs> Avery, Cheyenne. Is that close? Cheyenne. Nathan Marshall. Good job, Nathan. Have a seat. Owen Marshall. Carter Chessel. Cameron Lins, Bradley Roth, Griffin Timmermans, Jackson Malou, Kyle 
Wyatt. Stop. Slow it. Brett Chapman. We miss anybody? All right, I'm going to ask a quick favor of you. You need to place everything in your hands, report card wise, underneath your seats. So you have nothing in your hands, including drinks. Nothing, nothing. Give your attention for 10 minutes. We're going to talk a little bit about angles. It's an important topic to leave you with as the summer finishes. There's three things we basically talk about with angles. And I want us to understand this because it'll make your life a lot easier. Actually, I'll throw in a fourth because you're a smart group. It might be above your head, but we'll use it anyways. Parents, have you ever seen your kid during a game from where you're sitting up in the crowd watching them, seeing where they're placed in the net, and you can sort of see from behind the shooter how much net the shooter sees, and it scares you. Your kid's like giving up half the net or they're off the angle. Have you guys ever said that happen where you've been off the angle? <laughs> I can put any one of you, parents, true statement, I can put any one of these kids in the NHL tomorrow, no problem. If I had the remote control to use in that Adam Sandler movie, Click, where you can pause and fast forward life, because what I would be able to do, I'd be able to pause it on the line rush, and I could take even the world's worst goalie, like Mika Breyer, for instance, and I could put him in the NHL because I would pause it, move him over to the proper angle, the proper depth, raise the ready stance, and then press play again, and he stopped 95% of the shots because he's in the right spot at the right time. This topic here is going to deal with knowing where that right spot is. Now there's some geometry we're talking about angle play. And that's used to be shaped like that, but I like drawing them like that. Because if you look at it the right way, it's kind of funny. <laughs> Looking down at the ice, there's the crease, there's the net. Every puck makes a shooting triangle, hence the shape of the triangle. Wherever the puck is on the ice, there's a line from the post to the puck. And as a goaltender, we're intimately concerned with being in the middle of this shooting triangle. So if there's a guy out here shooting the puck, there's his stick, there's his feet. You want to make sure you're in the middle of that shooting triangle. Can we see the shooting triangle on the ice? Invisible. But in our mind's eye, we have to train ourselves to know what it looks like so we can always be in the middle of it. We talked today about poor angle shots. And we talked about what this area is called there. Anybody remember? What's this area right here called? Yep, the slot. The most lucrative spot for somebody to shoot is the slot because the net is its full six foot width right there. Now contrast that with the puck over here on the poor angle. Look what happens to the shooting triangle. It gets very thin, as we talked about on the ice. In some cases, the width of a mini stick net. How bad would you smell if you gave up a goal on a mini stick net with your full goalie equipment on? How bad would you have to be to give up a goal on that? Really bad. Really bad. What about when the puck's right on the line? What's a shooting triangle look like there? Yeah? Just a straight line. Just a straight line. There's actually no triangle, it's just a line. What about behind the goal line? There's none. There's not, a, there's not a shooting triangle. So let's see if we follow that concept, and I'm going to pick a couple kids that are great listeners to come up and take these sample pucks and draw the shooting triangle that corresponds to the puck I, I lay out. This is going to be puck one, puck two, and puck four. Don't ask the tough questions. Can you do a shooting triangle for puck number one? Excellent. Can you do the shooting triangle for puck number four? Outstanding. Can you do the shooting triangle for puck number two to the exponent two? If he gets this right, he gets a t-shirt. Close. That's all right, keep going, you got it. That's, that's for puck number two, he nailed it. 
Anybody, just since we're getting ready for school again, no, two that's one and two is anyone? We have school in Canada, right? Yeah. You got any other buddy high school here? And you don't know what two to the exponent two is? Yeah. <laughs> Last one, trick question. Okay. For a free t-shirt, give me the shooting triangle to that one. No one? Make sure you draw the straight lines. There is no shooting triangle, so no one gets a free t-shirt. Oh, we'll do it later. It's 9 o'clock tonight, we'll have the table set up here. <laughs> so we understand the triangle. You also need to understand a misused term called square to the puck. Parents, goalies, you've heard the term, the goalie was square to the puck all night. It simply means the goalie's chest was facing at the puck. It has no connection to the net. For instance, if this table was the net, the backup goalie sitting on the bench all night could be perfectly square to the puck. As long as wherever the puck went, his chest kept facing it. It has nothing to do with the net. So being square simply means facing the puck. Here's why that's important. Imagine this is a goalie. And imagine Noah, in his diminutive head here, is a puck. Which covers more net? A goalie that's perfectly square or a goalie that's not quite as square? It's obviously the goalie's going to be the widest when you're perfectly square, when your shoulders are both the same distance from the puck. So when somebody says square up, what they're simply meaning is face the puck. You guys may not realize this. I'm a very shy guy, but I actually have some friends. I've got two key friends in my life. My first friend, and I'm the politically incorrect goalie coach, in case you're curious. If you're offended, that's your problem, not mine. His name's Fat Tony. <laughs> He's got a preponderance of subcutaneous adipose tissue. Fat Tony is 280 pounds of pure... You know how wide he is? Four feet wide. And if he stays back on the goal line, this is what he looks like. <laughs> Big belly button there. So since Tony's four feet wide, how wide is the net? Six feet total is how wide the net is. So how much room is right in here on either side of him between the post and him? One foot on each side. Now, Fat Tony, I dragged him in a forklift to goalie school one day, and I taught him to come on out and challenge. And by coming out to challenge, what has he done to the available space beside him? Yeah? There's no space to score. Well, if that's the case, if by coming out, we can cut down all the angle, why do we not just come right out to here? What's wrong with that approach, yeah? They'll go around you by skating it around, or they might pass it to somebody else. So we need to find out how far we come out. And since most of us goalies aren't the most uh, highly functioning people cognitively, which means we're not very smart, they left us a little line on the ice to help make it simple. As a rule of thumb, if you're always standing somewhere with your feet at the top of the crease, that's a pretty good distance to come out. There's situations where you can challenge more. There's situations where you can challenge less. Now I use that saying, rule of thumb. Do any parents know the historical context to that saying, rule of thumb? Anyone? Any school teachers in here? Back in England, you were allowed to beat your wife with the rod no bigger than the size of your thumb. That's where it came from. So I'm just saying, I'm a teacher. I just, don't kill the messenger. I didn't come up with it. As a rule of thumb, I don't like to use that saying. <laughs> Besides being the 23rd best goalie coach on the planet, I'm an amazing artist. It's a side view of a net, you could probably tell. There's the ice, there's the net, and there's a puck. Now I have another friend, his name's Fat Jorge, and he's also very short. He's even fatter than Tony. He's six feet wide. But he's only three feet tall. 
So, there's another aerial, there's an aerial angle created from the puck to the crossbar. So if you shoot the puck up this high, where's it gonna go? Over the net. What if we shoot it right on that line, where's it gonna go? What if we shoot it one nose hair below that line? Crossbar down, like I did to one of the kids in the Elite Showdown. Who was that? You felt the wrath of near the angle, didn't you? Now, how much room is available above this guy? Because I told you he's three feet tall. And how big is the net? So if you stay back on the goal line, there's one foot of space, you can elevate it over the goalie. Now, again, we dragged him in an 18-wheeler to the hockey school. He decides to come out to the top of the crease. And if you see what happens by coming out, what does he do to the top shelf? He completely smothers it, and there's no room. And that's one of the myths a lot of parents may believe, that goalies that go down leave the top shelf open. To a degree, that's true when you're a small, diminutive, smurf-like creatures like Emma. If you go down, you leave the top shelf open. But let me illustrate something for you. Parents, the average goalie in the NHL is six foot two. That's the average. Pekka Rene, who plays for the Nashville Predators, is six foot six. He uses, well, in inches, how tall is the post? Does anybody know? In inches. 48 inches. What size pads do you think Pekka Rennie wears? 42 inch pads. So above Pekka Rennie's thighs, there's six inches of net. So let me continue the diagram here. I'll get very creative. I'll, I'll show you a knee bend, show you the shins, I'll show you his big feet, show you his big finished butt. Shoulders up here, heads here. So, what problem does Pekka Rene have if he stands up on his feet when they shoot? Here's the number one problem. All of this is just protecting the scoreboard. It's not even protecting the net. The only thing in the net is from his waist down. That's if he's back on the goal line. Look what happens when he comes out. He's over here. He challenges out the top of the crease. It's probably from his knees. So we understand the reason why NHL goalies leave their feet is because the biggest, fattest part of your body is your hips, your shoulders, and your upper body. Your little tiny 11-inch pads don't cover a lot of net. So by coming out, the big goalies drop. They actually eclipse the net, like you've seen a solar eclipse. You can't even see any net. So make sure we understand when we're talking about angle play, when to go down, when to stand up, how to come out, a shooting triangle, squareness, all that neat stuff. Last little topic. A very smart, reasonably intelligent, attractive man came up with that slogan one time. You guys all get <laughs> moderately. You get no rebound stickers because that's my mindset. If you stop a lot of pucks, you're going to be popular with your beer league teammates, and you'll tell everybody how you could have made the NHL, but then you didn't. If you control pucks, then you drive Lamborghinis and fancy cars. You have to control the puck. So one of the things that we try to do is understand rebound control in a very detailed way. I actually developed this system several years ago. It's used in the NHL. There's a $1.99 app that I don't get any money for. It's called Shot Tracker, and parents, this is how you can quantify how well your kid's doing with rebound control. Very simple, simple solution. Watch this. There's a score that every shot on net gets given based on what type of rebound you leave. And it goes from a great rebound all the way to a dirty day. <laughs> Smellier the longer you go. What's the best case scenario when it comes to rebound control of any shot, a guy takes a slapper at the goalie, what's the best thing that can happen? Yeah? Um, okay. Possession. Outstanding. And possession could be, as an example, catching it cleanly, gut trap, hip or soft catch. When you possess the puck, I'll give you an earth shattering secret. The other team can't score. Your team has the puck. 
So the best rebound is possession. Now sometimes I'll talk to head coaches and they'll say, my goal is to do a great job controlling rebounds because they put every rebound in the corner. That's the second best one, and it's pretty safe, and actually I place it over my line of death. It's good, but it's not the best. Here's why. If you make a save and you turn it over into the corner, you make one of your defensemen go over to the corner and a couple of their guys, and they fight for the puck in what you call a one-on-one -on -one battle or a two-on-one -on -one battle. And because it's a battle, what happens sometimes? Yeah? Maybe the so it could be a penalty or you lose the puck and they can come back in front. So it's temporarily safe. So for me, if you're always getting possession or putting the puck to the corners, I'll be happy. Here's where we start to get into the poop. I always say poop because of elementary age kids, they seem to laugh at that sometimes. You just have to say poop. <laughs> a square rebound. I'll give you an example. Guy comes down the wing named Alexander Ovechkin. He passes over at the All-Star game to Steven Stamkos. Takes a hard slapper from like right there. You come over, he takes a 90 mile an hour shot from right there. What's the odds of us getting rebound control on that? We're just hoping to stop it. So if we can't get possession, we can't get it to the corners, at least keep it in front of us. Because if he hits it again, at least you're facing him. But bear in mind, if you're purposely booting rebounds out in front, what's going to happen a lot? They're going to score. It's only one small little saving feature. You can't do the other ones for some reason. At least keep it in front of you so you have a chance. The next one, and that one, very similar situation, would look like this. Pass comes over, guy corks one from 10 feet away. You don't get possession. You don't get it to the corners. You don't keep it in front of you. you leave it over like that. Then you got a problem, because that guy has a whole empty net. Now, how many of you have let a weak side rebound before? You're challenging on the wing, puck hits you, and you leave a little squirter over there. We've all done that. And then the next one that clearly follows after that is a goal. Parents, here's where your mathematics training comes in. Very simple. Every shot your goalie gets, you give them a score. So they catch a point shot, what score would they get? Al McKinnis takes a slot for blocker side low and they get a stick on it, ramp it up to the corner, what would they get? You let in a long bouncer from the other end, Vesta Tosselo, what would you get? Five. So you add up in the game. Suppose you had 30 shots and you added up all those scores, you'd come up with an average. We all know how to calculate average because we all paid specific attention in school on creating averages. So for instance, at the end of the game, if your goalie had a 1.38 rebound control efficiency, it means he's somewhere in here, is that a good game? Yes, because you're getting possession, or you're putting it to the corners a lot. If your rebound control efficiency was 3.8, you're booting pucks out in front, you're letting greasy weak side rebounds, you're likely giving up goals, that's not a good game. That shot tracker app, calculates it all for you automatically, does a game by game, creates a spreadsheet, a running total, and a little graph to see if your goal is getting better or worse for $1.99. Shot Tracker, it's a good app to get. Before I forget, make sure you go to our Facebook page and like it. That's what it is right on the interweb, it's a Facebook thing. And what's the Twittering? What is that? I don't know. Twittering and some Facebook stuff, I don't know. Do it, whatever it is with the internet, with my website and stuff. We've got a couple things to talk about before you go. Uh, we have an early sign-up contest, and this week we had some previous winners attend. We had Rain Stedman attend this week. I think he's out in the ice right now in the advanced group. And Rain got a chance to meet an NHL goalie of his choice, and last year he went to meet a guy named Mark andre Fleury. So first prize, if you want to sign up early for the next hockey school, first prize is to meet an NHL goalie of your choice. We brought kids to meet Marty Broder. Uh, last year obviously was uh, Mark andre Fleury. Uh, have to be a living goalie, currently playing, and I will not bring you to see a Montreal Canadiens goalie. <laughs> Hang on, listen. I dropped my standards, and I did bring a kid to meet Terry Price two years ago from Dorchester. The kid's name was Ashton Moore, so we got to meet Terry Price. Second prize, a free set of custom pads, which Griffin, did you not win? At one point, he won the contest, had a free set of pads. So if you're interested, you just have to sign up early today by putting a deposit in. 
you save 100 bucks off your camp, and you also can change locations, levels, etc. at any time. We have tons of private lessons with Sprouts and myself during the season, which are on the back of that forum we gave you, as well as all the Christmas camps. We're doing bi-weekly camps out of the arena. Some merchandise up front if you're interested. We have shirts for $10, hats for five bucks. Don't have any change, don't ask. DVDs, I have special price, get rid of them at the end of the summer here. There's eight DVDs, four in each. Total, you get both of these 50 bucks if you want. Anybody wants pictures, autographs, any of that type of stuff from uh, Gigabaz or me, let me know. Otherwise, I'll hang it up front. There's that website, internet stuff. If you want to squeeze in one more camp, we're Goddard next week, and he's in Woodstock. So if you're interested, go online and get the camp for half off. That's the end of the camp. I'll hang out up front. Otherwise, I like the behavior. I only had to beat up three kids this week. Is the camera running at me admitting to an assault? <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you later, guys. <laughs>